I, and I guess maybe just to remind people as well that are we live right now, Kira? Uh, about to go live. Or just that we're, we're taking written questions only. Okay. I, and I guess maybe just to remind people as well that okay, are we live right now, Kira? Uh, about to go live. Sorry, folks, that was just the, I was testing the YouTube live stream. That's up and running. Uh, got it. Happy days. I have your connection now. I can send this to me, Dal. <laughs> it's no, not actually allowing me to change my name. Okay, let me check the... Very tight script. controls. <laughs> uh, that should be, you should be able to, to change your name now. Great, thanks. I can now. Thank you. How's my audio? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, that's, that's much better now, actually. Yeah, that is actually. Mm. Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> Perfect. So um, whenever you're ready, we have some people in the waiting room. I expect that more will join as the event goes on and there'll be people watching it through YouTube live stream. Yeah, we should probably we should probably start for about five past, aren't we? Great. Yeah. So I'm just gonna read the backup and uh, letting in everyone in the waiting room. Grant, whenever you're ready. Is everybody muted? Hello. Hi, everybody. Okay, so we're good to go. So welcome everybody uh, to this one of the many events that are, are being um, put on this week as part of the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, which I think everybody is, is well aware of at this stage. And there's many other events and many of the events that have already happened are available um, online and, and, and can, be, uh, can be looked at. Uh, my name is Paul O'Connor from the Pat Finucane Centre here in Derry. And we're very pleased to co-sponsor this group, this event with the uh, Bloody Sunday Trust. We will um, begin by by um, introducing our speakers and 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 talking to them about the incredibly important work of the Irish Network Against Unity. And then, I suppose, towards the latter half, we will uh, invite people to submit questions via chat uh, for our uh, participants. Um, and I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll start obviously with, with Shane O'Curry, um, who's known to some people in this parish, who has links here to the Northwest that I, I think he'll be talking about. And also by, we're proud to have uh, Patricia Munazzi and Maria Ilana Costa Sar, also from the, the, the Irish Network Against Racism, and Nedson Ingoma. Um, there were particular issues about participation in this event for our visitors, our friends that are based in Dublin. And I think maybe we should start with that, Shane, as, as director, maybe you could share with, with our audience what those difficulties were just facing us today. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Paul. It's great to be here and it's great to be here with old friends and old colleagues and to, and to be here with my new colleagues. And I, I, I love, this idea of being able to bring us together. Unfortunately, we're not able to be there uh, in person, uh, partly because uh, even today, Nedson hasn't got his passport back from the British Embassy in Dublin. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, almost two months ago, we got an invitation from the Papua Newcomb Centre to come and attend this event. And uh, because uh, Nedson is a Malawian national who has, you know, he's, he's fully and appropriately documented for uh, the 26 counties for the Republic of Ireland. Uh, but because of UK law, because of the border regime, because of um, uh, British policy in the north, uh, it, there is a requirement on him to apply for a special visa, even for a one or two day visit to visit projects and to um, and people uh, and to commemorate Bloody Sunday in the North. Um, and so we thought that it would be cautious 
uh, uh, and, and um, responsible for us to apply for a visa. We didn't want to risk Nedson getting deported or, or, or anything unsavory happening to him. Um, and so we applied for the visa. Um, and as I say, we applied six weeks ago. Uh, one calendar month ago, we got acknowledgments uh, from the British, uh, British Embassy's visa office uh, that they had received the visa and that it would issue within the next 15 days. Um, and he has heard nothing back uh, from them. Um, and now he's, he, he, he can't get through on the phone. There is a special phone line that he can take, and I think it, but they cost, they charge you six pounds a minute. Um, there's an email, you can make email inquiries, but they also charge. So it's a trap. Um, and so because of that, we're not able to be there in person. And we think that that's a great pity. And we think it's indicative of the systemic racism that a, a border regime imposes on people um, who are here and who want to come and visit. So I suppose that's from the outset, that's a thing. Um, yeah. And also, just I, it was just something that I discussed briefly with Nedson before we came on here. So I just want to acknowledge and thank Nedson for that. And he might want to say a thing or two about that himself. Yeah, we 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 return to that. That's I mean that's I think for a lot of people here, would be quite shocked to hear that that process just dragged on and and had no positive outcome. I think I probably also share the views of a lot of people. I find it wrong that a, a British embassy determines who travels where on this island. You know, I I, I think that's such a shock, but. Needless to say, we'll move on. Um, Shane, you have some, uh, you, you, you're now director of the Irish Network Against Racism, uh, an organization for which I think we have a, a lot of respect. Um, you, have some, you have some experience up here in the, in the Northwest. Um, maybe you'd like to share um, your, your roots of, of, of uh, your prior experience with our good selves. Yeah, so I was, um, uh, I, you know, I've been living in, uh, I, I lived in Derry, from uh, 1996 until uh, 2010, um, and or Derry and, and, and the area around Derry, and uh, I was in I was finishing my degree in Derry in 1996 when the Drum Cree riots ha happened, or the post Drum Cree riots in, in in Derry happened in July 1996, and I was witness to them, and I was witness to the police tactics and police brutality and the brutalization of the community and, and, and the community anger in response to that. And um, I was shocked to hear the BBC uh, carrying uh, a, an RUC narrative uh, verbatim unchallenged. Uh, that, you know, so in other words, that the a police version of events uh, was unchallenged when the reality that I had seen and that I was hearing from people was radically different. Um, and the Papua Newcan Centre put out a call for people to take witness statements uh, so, that a, uh, so that a report of these things could happen. And I uh, volunteered and took a number of witness statements. And then in the weeks that followed, sat with other volunteers in the Papua Newcan Centre. And we uh, compiled a report which eventually became the report known as One Day in August, uh, which very successfully uh, challenged the dominant narrative mm -hmm. and the, it was just the simple the, the elegant and simple beauty of that of using people's own words their first-hand testimonies to challenge dominant narratives um, that really got me hooked and I think everything I did uh, you know and I, vol I increasingly volunteered for the Papua Newcomb Centre and then eventually became an employee of the Papua Newcomb Centre working there um, and it was just that um, it, 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 this was the, the hook for me, was that you, could, you should use uh, people's own experiences and narratives in their own words to challenge do dominant narratives and that it could be done and so effectively. Um, and there were, there's a lot of skills and other things that, you, that sort of flow from that that, that, uh, uh, you know, that, that necessitates. And, and those are things that I've been thinking about every ever since and those are things that I've had conversations with various colleagues about including the colleagues present here and the work that they do really all speaks to those conversations and to that very simple beautiful principle of uh, listening to people who are affected by forms of violence and discrimination and uh, foregrounding those experiences and their own words and experience uh, 
to challenge dominant narratives and to change things and to and to change policies. Uh, so that was the okay. That was the hook. Yeah. Yeah. So so at that stage you carried on documenting sectarian and racist attacks here in the north, uh, which wasn't being done at the time. And and now you, obviously one of the roles of of Enar is to to document racist attacks. And I was I was intrigued on your website. You offer people various uh, methods to do that, and um, you offer people a, 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 an online video, for instance, of how to detect racism and and how to deal with racist incidents, which I thought was was really innovative and, uh, and incredible. Um, on the website, it talks about a network of groups that feed information back to you, if I have understood that correctly, a, a network of some 40 groups around Ireland. Would, would any one of you, um, you know, from, from Enar, want to explain that, maybe a bit of the backdrop to, to, to our audience? Um, Patricia, would you like to follow that one up? Uh, I suppose for people that, that aren't uh, really well aware of what it is that, that the network does, of how that ne network functions. You're muted at the moment. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, um, I, at the Irish Network Against Racism, we work with, um, uh, we are a network organization of over 162 organizations um, that work in the human rights field. So what we do is uh, we work in, in collaboration with, with our network members to sort of empower uh, individuals, um, particularly from minority ethnic groups, to be able to advocate for themselves, and you know, to empower them to take the con the different conversations around uh, racism and racial discrimination uh, in the civic space, and obviously to contribute in terms of um, different policy initiatives and policy discussions around uh, combating racism. Uh, we also have a, a platform. Um, uh, the I report where uh, individuals, not just victims, are able to report um, uh, racist incidences. So, uh, as a as a bystander, as a third party witnessing racism, you can also go to um, our I report platform, which is at uh, www.iReport.ie, uh, uh, where you can report the incidences. It is very easy to use. It's uh, user friendly. Um, you can just report the incidences and then, you know, we collect uh, the different incidences and turn them into, into our annual report, which we use at the Irish Network Against Racism, you know, for advocacy purposes. Uh, I, I know that, you know, um, there is, uh, you know, uh, the, the discussion that, you know, when we get into different spaces and talk about racism, the existence of racism in Ireland. There are people that, you know, say in different, you know, political issues that say, you know, racism doesn't exist, where is the data? So this is where uh, the yeah. I report uh, is absolutely important because then it showcases that racism is, is real, racism exists in, in Ireland and these are the numbers. So um, data collection is key in, 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 in terms of that and we it comes in form of, of, of the different reports that come on the I report platform. So it's absolutely uh, a, a key. And we use that for, you know, to advocate for policy changes with, with, with the Irish government. So yeah, absolutely, that's what I would say. Yeah. And, and so would your monthly reports be fed back to authorities at various levels within government and statutory bodies? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, for instance, now that we are working um, on the National Action Plan I know, against racism and at the Irish Network, we are also developing you know, a shadow report. So definitely these reports would be something that we use in, in, in the different platforms that we go to in discussions in, in, in terms of combating racism with different government ministries. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, okay. I, I had a brief chat with Shane about this, one, one of the issues, which is the, the title of today's event. Um, and I, I think somewhere in the title, it talks about the growth of far right um, race, you know, far right groups in Ireland and, and the dangers that they pose. Shane had a particular take on it. Maybe we'll move back to that. But I was wondering from, from, from our other participants, um, I think, Shane, you'd suggested that you think actually there is not a growth as such. It may be more visible, but there's not a growth, but rather because of some of the excellent anti-racist work that's going on, they're getting exposed for who they are. I, I mean, Maria, Ilana, in your experience, do you, 
particularly over the last couple of years, a very unusual situation we've been in. We've seen far right groups sometimes latch on to the anti-vaccination protests and so on. I mean, from your perspective, I, I don't actually know where you live, but uh, and, and we don't need to know where you live. But have you seen an increase in incidents or um, do, do you think that there's very effective work being done? Both could be true. Well, true, actually. Um, I guess growing up in the UK, I would have an understanding of far right activity um, and the growth of the far right. I'm happy to say that she's absolutely right. Uh, the far right hasn't so far gained a foothold in Ireland in the same way that it has um, in other countries. Um, but it is trying to mobilise, and we can see that um, through um, its links. Um, and it's it's you know it's it's attempts latch on to particular people um, who then again as you say around um, anti vaccination may have taken platforms and come up with populist information around there. Um, there's the Gemma Doherty's, uh, the Dolores uh, Hills, um, all of whom do kind of use um, social media as a platform to um, propagate. Um, some some kind of far right views, but I mean, it is really important that there is um, an observation of things. Um, there are mechanisms that actually allow people to report far right activity. Um, it does happen, and we are increasingly hearing of incidents as well. Um, and I think that's where it goes. It like the whole notion of DI report um, and the ability to use that mechanism to inform the state of, of what's actually happening is, is so important. Um, so, yeah. And, and the mechanism for reporting that would be in the I report, would be your website. That's where the city, people should actually go there and, 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 and report that. It is. It's a very, very easy, accessible mechanism. Um, and it shows it's how to do it on the website um, and it's been interesting to see what what people do and and don't report but I mean what I'm also interested in is is the notion of the I report really being um, the mechanism by which you see um, that community mobilization I think the I report is almost um, a result of people becoming community activists and actually understanding it's 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 less um, it's true that people do do come together and they do like they people do in, report individual incidents but where it's most useful is when we've done that community work and we've worked with say the roma community the traveler community to actually explain to them why it's important to to, to go to use things like the i report as, as reporting uh -huh. uh -huh. i think yeah those are the links that i was you know when i was looking at um the, the pat finucan center and that that ability to mobilize a community to tell what's happening on the ground, the facts to tell, the their, to tell their story. Absolutely. Yeah. Shane, do you want to come in at this point? I, I think, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to. I always want to speak, so I better, better, I better watch it. Um, um, uh, yeah, just to, so that you know, the I report, I suppose, the I report system, the way it was conceived was to remove as many barriers as possible between uh, people's narratives about what's happened to them uh, and getting them to the public, right? So it was a, um, so the idea is it's, it's self-report um, uh, or somebody can support you or, uh, uh, or uh, you know, an ally can write on your, or your behalf or somebody can, uh, a witness can also, can also write it. And the idea is to capture um, and, you know, be very transparent about your methodology, but to say, uh, look, these are the patterns that we're seeing again and again. Um, and, you know, and, and from that, we used to publish our, our, our reports uh, three monthly, and then we moved to six monthly, um, and then and now we've moved to annual reports. But it's the same, um, and it's basically just because there's so much work in analyzing the data, and 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 your data is more reliable over a 12 month period. Uh, but we've had the consistent data for the last eight years, which really shows that our methodology is robust. And we have used these to, um, you know, to you know, so we've we've submitted very robust reports to the Commission on the Future of Policing in Ireland, uh, to the Policing Authority, to uh, to to the Houses of the Oireachtas. We've brought our data to UN CERD, 
uh, to the OSCE, which monitors comparative hate crime data mm -hmm. across different countries. So we've been able to uh, to to use it, and as Marielana says, it's also there's a there's a community development piece to it as well, and a mobilisation piece to it. Um, that you know we encourage people to use the data creatively, to use it to self advocate, and to use their their own data gathered locally to advocate locally with it as well. And that's that's the vision. And our vision, of course, is that um, is that there will be more and more analysts and advocates of the I report system who are themselves from minority ethnic uh, backgrounds and who will be able to produce um, uh, reports with which they can directly advocate for policy change uh, at a national and a local level as well. Um, just, uh, just on the, on, uh, on the far right, I think the far, uh, the, the, the far right in Ireland, I think had a breakthrough, uh, their biggest breakthrough was, uh, to the extent that you can call it a breakthrough, was in, in, in 2018, 19, I think it, that was probably at the time when the authorities on Garda Síochána uh, were at their lowest guard with regards to the far right. They were always fixated on the left and on Republican and Republicanism. Um, they just didn't have their eye on the far right and on the on on the harms being done. You know, they weren't listening to minority ethnic communities. Um, and I think that it was the, you know, the, there was the kind of the, the perfect storm of the kind of the, the Brexit wave, uh, you know, in the Anglosphere and on the mm. internet, the, the Trump, the post-Trump wave, um, and when social media platforms uh, were at their slackest uh, as well uh, with regards to responding to the far right. Um, and it was the the arrival in Ireland of some figures from the North American white supremacist movement, which provided the catalyst uh, for actions in Ruski and Moville, which, and I think that that was, and you know, as well, you had Peter Casey, uh, the presidential candidate, who mm -hmm. saw that he could, you know, emulate Trump and gain some political leverage by spouting some really hateful anti-traveler rhetoric. And so all of this just sort of created a perfect storm. And you had then the arson attacks uh, in Moville and in Ruski. Um, and I think that that was the, the kind of, the, 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 from the point of view of hateful violence, the highest point, the peak, uh, the peak of that. Um, I think very rapidly since then, uh, some very capable actors uh, in the anti-racist and anti-fascist uh, community um, it brought their tremendous skills to bear very quickly and coordinated people to uh, to put a stop to these. And I'd like to I'd like to really sort of tip a hat to the people who eventually came to form the newly formed Far Right Observatory, uh, but also internationally the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, uh, emergent groups like uh, European Network uh, Against against Van Enam, the, which is um, supported by the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, um, different groups like Trademark, Belfast, um, the Communities Against Racism, FCAR, um, you know, but, but some very strong allies in Unite the Union, um, and there's groups like AFA Ireland, Lekela, The Beacon, and so on. All of these groups have um, done a tremendous job in uh, not just monitoring the far right, but disrupting them. Uh, stopping the, the fundraising events to the extent that they can here. I suppose the extent that the far right are still, uh, the success that they still do have, I think has nothing to do with the traction that they have in the community um, because they haven't been able to make an electoral breakthrough. None of them have be, even been able to retain their electoral deposits. I mean, they've been, it's been a resolute failure for them. They have no traction. Um, but all of them have got overseas resourcing in some form or another. So the Irish, Irish Freedom Party is a farageist um, astroturf in Ireland. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 its leader, Herman Kelly, is uh, Nigel Farage's uh, former aide. Um, um, you know, the ideas, the messaging, the platform itself, uh, you know, appear to have been resourced by the British right. Um, uh, you know, other actors uh, have got, um, you know, connections to Ulster loyalism and the far right. Um, um, you know, another uh, one video vlogger is himself an ex-British army soldier with, with links to 
to Ulster loyalism. I mean, they're they're discredited. I suppose the only other player is the National Party, which um, you know, which uses the same graphics as the South African National Party, apartheid or South African National Party, yeah. has links to um, has links to Italian and German neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups going back thirty years. Its leader does. And they came out of the rump of the anti-abortion uh, kind of uh, ultra-Catholic uh, scene. Um, but, you know, all of the, none of these have got much traction, but because they have resources and because they're able to utilize uh, the internet, social media platform and, and chat rooms such as Reddit and so on, uh, they have a disproportionate uh, influence. I guess also there's an interest in them yeah. From overseas, from the US and the UK, because they have, because yeah. they because we're English speaking, and they and they can put resources behind them. But just to yeah. say, yeah, sorry, I've been no, going no, on. Actually, I mean, that's 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 yeah. mapping out where we are yeah. in terms of what what organisation there is there, or organisations and their international links. And I suppose to flag up for the audience that that groups like the Far Right Observatory provide uh, excellent information. Leaving aside the, the, that that issue of the kind of organised racist groups that, that, that exist and we, that we sometimes see on, on our television screens and such. I'm also interested, and, and this is a question that also applies in, in terms of gendered violence, I'm also interested in what the, the kind of casual racism that people face because I think it's very true that, you know, as white European males, we just don't experience it and don't really understand it. We, we've got no idea, just as we've very little idea of, of, uh, of what happens with, with women and girls and such. Nelson, I, 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 um, I'm just wondering for you, for instance, when I walked down the street in Dublin, when you walked down the street in Dublin, um, what are the differences in experience? And has that got worse or has it maybe improved somewhat? Yes, um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, so the thing is, uh, there are, of course, stark differences because there are a lot of experiences that only a few people observe and only a few people can actually relate to. And the thing about measuring about about measuring if it has gotten worse or if it has gotten better is we also have to keep in context the phenomenon of underreporting, right? So, for example, I might have an experience and I might be in a position to go and report it either with the I report or not with the I report. But then there are also a lot of people out there that may go through the similar experience that may go through abuse, that may go through like uh, maybe casual racism or even plain out like institutional racism that they may go through, but they might not actually report it. So it's always important when you're looking at issues like this to look at, for example, power relations, what may make people not report and what will make people report. Uh, so in a nutshell, I would say that if you're going to look at trends and experiences, it would be really hard to tell the actual dynamic whether it's rising or it's falling because it does depend on uh, how much people are reporting. And it is in some instances, when we have a lot of cases, it may just be that, okay, people are more aware that these reporting mechanisms that, that might be there. So I think it, it might be good that we're saying, okay, these people are reporting it, but not necessarily it might mean that the cases themselves are uh, maybe either falling or rising. So you have to keep that in context as well. But from a personal experience uh, throughout the years and with discussions that I'm having with people, it's that while, for example, if you look at the context of like the 2020 Black Lives Matter movement, as well as uh, the protests that happened after the George, uh, the George and Kendrick matter, like people had hope after those periods that like, okay, maybe something is happening to address racism on it. But the general outlook is that people still don't understand what it is. People don't, although some people might understand what maybe, okay, what abuse might be like, what racially motivated abuse may be like, but some people do still don't understand what institutional racism is. And I think that's why it's important for platforms like uh, INR to have those information sessions to actually push the discussion and let people know that, okay, you know what, these are the cases that are there. This is institutional racism. This is personal racism, this is systemic racism. And I think those discussions are really important. So sorry that I kind of went, I went, I kind of went here and there with that, but just wanted to provide a bit more context to the discussion. No, and I mean, when we're talking about the discussions that need to happen, 
I mean, th there's been a lot of soul searching, obviously, in Ireland in the last couple of weeks uh, about how we need to look at, at, at various types of violence that are visited upon the people that live here. And I'm just wondering, are there is there learning uh, across in terms of what might be done in, in terms of gendered violence and, and what's happening with racist incidents? I, I guess also to put this as an open question to Maria Elena or to Patricia, um, and for instance, is there work being done at the moment, anti-racist work within schools that involves yourselves or other organizations? And in what way could those discussions be brought forward if they are happening? I'll leave it open to either which one of you. I'll let you go first, Patricia, <laughs> because I can see your are yes. going to hop out of your chair if you don't have your say. And I'll no, come no. back to my <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Maria Elena. Um, I think that, um, yes, with, with what has been happening, you know, with the start of the pandemic and still ongoing, there has been a little bit of work around, you know, uh, conversations on, on racism, how to combat racism in different levels of, of society. But, you know, personally um, speaking as a, an, a, an ethnic minority in Ireland and uh, um, all lot that could be done in terms of moving the discussions um, about racism and, and, and gendered violence uh, and actually putting in place you know, legislative measures and also putting in place um, policy initiatives that actually help in terms of combating racism. I think you know, uh, Ireland has a long way to go um, uh, in terms of really you know, taking the discussions further. If you look at, you know, I was recently a student at uh, University College Dublin. Um, when I got there, I really didn't feel like, you know, there are um, platforms where we could discuss. Yeah, Excuse me. Yeah, you experience racism, you know, from microaggressions to really blatant, you know, racism in, in different shops. I remember my first experience of going into a, a supermarket here in Africa, you know, somebody called me a monkey, but I had no idea, you know, where to go, how to discuss, you know, in, in mm. these this issues, where to report and it has happened, you know, every other day. I'm, I mean, I'm never going to change. I'm always going continue to experience you know racism and discrimination because of the color of my skin and also because I'm a, I happen to be a woman so I think that uh, Ireland needs to you know put more effort and they needs to go beyond just the different conversations about racism or just limiting it to interpersonal experiences because you know the legacy of racism is complex it's deeply you know personal it's ugly but it goes beyond just our interpersonal uh, Irish government needs to acknowledge that it's not it's no longer about you know somebody calling me a monkey it's about the systemic systemic system that is in place that is designed to exclude other people you know and benefit you know uh, so I think we need to go beyond that and also just in general to put in place policies that protect women I mean just recently we're talking about uh, the murder or you know or, or, uh, uh, and and in the 21st century, women are not safe anywhere. We are not safe to walk the streets. You, you can't go for a run, you can't go for a jog, you can't come back from a late night evening with your coworkers and still feel safe. So I think that we need to do more as a community. I think that as a society, we need to do more. Uh, minority, you know, ethnic minority people are facing for a system that was designed to exclude them. So absolutely. Um, I'm going to just jump in here and um, just, yeah. sorry, just, just jump in and tell you about one of the work of my colleague, uh, Patricia, who is conducting um, a series, she's conducted a series of consultations through the community and um, she's preparing a shadow report for the National Action Plan Against Racism and, you know, some of the work that she's come up with, her, like we were in a session with Roma Women, that was allowing us to really investigate that kind of intersectionality. What happens to Roma women isn't the same experience, even um, as the experience that traveler women would face as women of African descent. So kind of getting to some of that discussion, looking at what we sometimes call microaggressions, and then, then thinking about 
some of the things that have happened to those communities that further marginalize them, and then making the links between policy changes um, and action that the state needs to, to take to legislate, to protect um, um, our community. That's been extremely interesting stuff. Um, and so, yeah, I'd like to say that the NAPAR consultations have really kind of given us a really good grounding um, using our members who have told well, us about on the ground. Thanks for that. And, and where you're explaining some of the, 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 the amazing work that Patricia's been doing, maybe you could tell us something about your own work and maybe Nedson also following on could tell us something about your work. So do you want to start, Maria, Alana, if that's okay? Uh, uh, happily. Um, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to put together a, a training program that that um, actually brings minority ethnic leaders together. And so, you know, actually doing work around consultation um, around NAPAR has been a really good way of, of actually meeting um, many potential minority ethnic leaders and finding out what some of the issues are. So I'm going into communities, talking to communities about some of the issues. And then the idea behind it is to actually create um, those advocates, those self-advocates, it's actually based, I, I think my practice is based on the community development approach that we've mm -hmm. used, that has been used with say the traveler community, that, that approach where peer workers um, are trained and empowered to become activists who can self-advocate, identify yes. the problems for themselves and identify what solutions are needed. Um, and so, yes. yeah, that's, that's in a nutshell my work. The next three mm -hmm. years will be spent you know developing that community and developing that that leadership voice ability to um to to not just identify uh, racist incidents but to actually bring about um structural change um, uh -huh. okay Th thank you for thank you for that uh Nedson? yeah uh, thank you so um so i'm the network and communications officer so which means um almost involved in every piece of the work, trying to make sure that people are aware of what we're doing, trying to make sure that we access the people that we need to access, trying to make sure that the people that these programs are designed for are actually aware that the programs exist for them. So if I was to put it in a nutshell, of what was a little bit of a broad area, I would say a huge chunk of my work is communicating uh, to people from minoritized backgrounds uh, trying to ensure that they are aware of the programs that we have in place, uh, trying to ensure that uh, we are acknowledging the, the scenarios and trying to get experiences from them, uh, trying to ensure that we are actually bringing to light experiences of people that have been subject to injustices. So uh, we do this by promoting the iReport system, which I think my colleagues have adequately mentioned uh, how it works and what we do with that ensuring that they are aware of the program that, we're that we are implementing and they're aware of the advocacy what they were doing and things like that and also engaging with our, the members of our networks. And a, a crucial part, another part that we also do is that I also communicate these experiences. So uh, trying to bring it back to what we were discussing earlier, not only do we need these experiences of racism uh, as Patricia mentioned, not only do we need to like bring this forward and to counter the narrative of the far right that you know what racism is not here this thing is being blown out of proportion not only do we need uh these experiences to bring that forward but we also need it to like serve as a platform or uh, as a platform or as data to like counter the formal channels so that we can use it to lobby for policies like for example now we have our love not hate campaign where we are saying that you know what these are experiences that people face and they are discriminated against uh, these are the problems that people face. Can the government uh, implement and enact uh, a hate crime legislation where we actually send out a clear message that, you know what, we do not tolerate racism in this country and things like that. So mm -hmm. roughly, uh, <laughs> if I was to sum it up, I would say I, I coordinate the communications both from the minoritized backgrounds and people who are going through all of this uh, to the public and as well as ensuring that these experiences can be packaged and we can advocate uh, to make sure that people are safe and the victims that are faced with like uh, systemic injustices are able to like find solace and be able to we're able to like build a world that's better for everybody. Okay. Um, um, before I I'm going to go back to Shane for a minute, but before I do, just to encourage people that have joined us, uh, maybe at this stage to submit any questions you have in the chat box. 
and and, and the, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll raise those issues. As, Shane, just do you want to sum up of, of some of what you've heard from your colleagues and around that, and then we'll we'll see where we are with the the, the chat box and any questions there are. Um, well, really, I mean, just I just want to say how proud I feel of my colleagues. I'm just I'm extre I'm extremely sure. proud. So, well, so my three colleagues are relatively new to INR. Uh, we've had a had a staff changeover last year, so um, and uh, I um, I'm in awe of their expertise, and I learn from them all uh, every day. And I say that that, that isn't a platitude. I say that without exaggeration. So. Maria Lana and I are former colleagues in a traveler development project over 10 years ago where we worked together and I'm very excited to be working with her again and her expertise and her approach to communities and her instinctive understanding of people's needs and always asking the difficult question, always asking the awkward question, which I'm very, very grateful for. Um, Patricia as well brought, has, you know, is a formidable human rights activist and a, a meticulous uh, legal brain with a, with a, with a, a exceptional um, uh, capacity to capture detail and to and to remember very important things, and that that's proven so effective in her consultations on a shadow national action plan against racism, which is really crucial for us to address the systemic dimensions of of racism, not just the manifestations in hate crime and discriminatory incidents. But Trisha is really doing work going to the heart of you know the the levers of power and the policies and the and the you know the gaps and the defaults which leads to racist outcomes so it's really tremendous work that she's doing and she's bringing of course her perspective not just as a legal ex uh, expert but as somebody from the global south who is um uh, also who, who's who cut her teeth on uh gendered violence in southern africa and in taking in taking uh, strategic cases uh through the court system so i really i mean i stand in awe of patricia and her and 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 uh, and then Nelson again amazing with amazing uh, analysis uh, uh, also from the global south and, and with a with a perspective uh, on economics on history on the history of empire on the on, on the imp on the you know the you know the historical um, dimensions which uh, which reproduce themselves again and again with racist outcomes uh, and the global and uh, uh, eco economistic dimensions of, of inequality, oppression, and racism. Um, again, like tremendous, and um, uh, and also I just think I think Nelson's uh, I think Je Nelson's gender politics and his feminism, you know, for a man, uh, have to be congratulated too. It's just something. I mean, it goes without saying that Maria Lana and, and Patricia's gender politics are second to none. But it's just great. I just from my three colleagues, I learned so much. And we're very excited. We're just at the beginning of a journey together as a team and in really growing yeah. our practice. And um, again, like, so it's, it's nice for me to be with former colleagues from whom I've, I've learned a lot. I'm here with new colleagues who are teaching me more every day. So I'm just very excited to be, a, you know, part of this journey. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Well, before going to questions, I think we could probably yeah. add that you've done a fairly good job yourself, Shane. So, um, here, are there any questions? I'm not Sure. Yeah, we have a couple. Um, so our first question is for the panel. Um, so this is asking about um, what does it mean for people as individuals when they have this this outlet to report the racism that they're experiencing? So what does it mean for people as individuals when they report the racism that they're experiencing? I think they're talking about how does it feel for people, you know, rather than obviously it's very important that that's recorded, but uh, what does it mean for them personally? Maria, you've got, yeah, go. Cool. I'll, I'll just um, give you a tiny example before I hand over. I, I would say um, in the case of the Roma women that we were talking to the other day, the ability to actually voice that, that, um, what, whatever happens is incredibly powerful. When you, when you are, when you're in the middle of an incident, you're so shocked, you're so, you can't believe the injustice that's actually happening to you at the time. And the ability to report it, to have somebody um, listen to you and 
for a while to be thought of as, you know, to, to actually become, because many Roman women, I think, are invisibilized, the racism that they, they face, the discrimination that they face. Um, and again, the same for other women, whether you're a person of African descent or if you're um, South Asian or East Asian, you don't get to, to speak out, you don't get to explain to people about how that made you feel. So, um, yeah, the Eye Report is incredibly important about ca uh, in capturing that individual racism and that microaggression. Um, what I do think is really important, though, is that we actually do talk to communities again about how we we do bring them together and how we start to advocate for change there. So it, it, it becomes less about that person's individual experience and then more about creating that that change and that that civil society change. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking at the time and just saying, do you have other questions, Kira? Yeah, go ahead. Um, the other question is, oh, they've deleted them. Um, well, I think they, oh, um, what does it mean? Is there is there a difference between the racism that's happening in Ireland versus the racism that's happening in the UK? What's the relationship with um, Ireland being a former colony and how there's a denial about racism in Ireland? Patricia or Nedson, either of you like to take that on? Yeah, sorry. Do you mind just repeating the question? Because I think I missed the last bit. The difference between racism in Ireland and They're Wales. asking about uh, is there a difference between racism in Ireland and the UK? And what's the what's the link with denial of racism about the reality of racism in Ireland? Uh, where Ireland was a former colony. I think how you know people say, well, sure, we can't be racist. We were a former colony. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, that's, that's actually a really good question. It's actually, uh, it's one of those important things that you really need to discuss because obviously the history of Ireland is different, right? Because it, it was also a formalized, it, it was also a previously colonized country. So in a sense, there was a period in time where they were also racialized, right? So you can look at that history as well. So because they have experienced that, uh, they have experienced that shift and they have experienced that oppression, um, sometimes you may you tend to engage with individuals that are, oh yeah, we cannot be racist. But it is important to contextualize that to the point that when you're looking at it, uh, when you're looking at the contemporary scenario uh, to an individual who's coming here and you're being minoritized, you're looking at it while in the context where the Irish or the people in Ireland themselves do bear the benefits of uh, white supremacy and white power in terms of that, because they also, even though they were subjugated in that point and period in time, but the power relations that they do have with minoritized communities in here is different in that sense, in terms of uh, the power that they have, because obviously now they are effectively benefiting from their white privilege that's there. So it is true that there are these discussions, but it is important, it is important that we do understand that they are reaping these benefits. While for somebody like me who has studied the history and, is, uh, and really likes to look at things in a historical context, I would expect people from Ireland to understand it better, at least because they have gone through that whole process of being racialized and have and have have undergone systemic uh, oppression in different forms of life. So that is the only, I can say, uh, confusing bit where we're like, okay, you should try to understand this better because you have uh, understood this, I have, you have understood this process, but then in the, in the sense what you get in the end is denial. So yeah, there is that disconnect. I, I suspect we could have an entire session on the whole issue of colonization and how the Irish view the rest of the world. I suppose from the, from the purpose of accuracy, we might say that the 26 counties is a former colony. I'm not sure if it's really accurate to say that Ireland is a former colony since we still live in part of it where we don't control our own future. Um, are there any more questions? We're, we're slowly running or quickly running out of time. Uh, we could probably take another question. No, no, that's fine. Um, the, the other thing that was raised with us after we'd organized this event actually by Kira, 
was that it would be very interesting to do a similar event, but on a north-south basis, and to compare those experiences and what, what are the, the experiences of, of, of people here in the north and, and, and in, in the Republic. Um, again, because I think that a lot of people would like to pretend that a lot of racism in the north comes from loyalist paramilitaries and, and attacks and so on, and recent attacks in Belfast. But that that's probably absolutely not true. It's 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 um you know it's it's probably much more widespread and and there's questions that we all need to face. So maybe we can revisit that later this year. I I think it'd be really interesting. And I think the last point that was just brought up would be fascinating to draw that out more, and 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 to do that and to maybe organise something with the Northwest Migrants Forum and with other groups in Belfast and with your your good selves and others. Um, for my part, I, I find this absolutely fascinating. I really, really deeply appreciate that you were all able to, to, to join us, although I'm still um, angry about what's happened in Edson. And that we will right that wrong. You will come to Derry. We'll, we'll walk around Derry with you, take you to the museum and, and, and take you to, down to Bunkrana for a walk on the beach and a, and a pint. Um, so um, without further ado, um, Many thanks to, to, to all of you and to the, the people who helped to pull this together. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kira and Paul and, and everybody who helped to organize this. It was a real pleasure. Yeah, really, thanks very much. And a great, uh, a great idea to continue the conversation with our colleagues from anti-racism or organizations north of the border. Talk about racism north and south and, and the border itself as a as an instrument of racialization. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>